good singing. Go ahead and be seated this morning. Brother Josh is going to come. We're going to sing a song before we honor our fathers or those fathers that are in attendance here for our service this morning. <coughs> oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone. Oh, they tell me of that land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom. Sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of the king in his beauty there. And they tell me that mine eyes shall behold where he sits on the throne that is whiter than snow. In the city that is made of gold. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there. And his smile drives their sorrow all away. And they tell me that no tears ever come again. In that lovely land of unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. All right, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles this morning. Appreciate Brother Josh. He's very flexible when it comes to singing. He has the hard part because he has to sing the melody. And I remember when I was on Ambassadors, one time we were uh, singing at a church down in Mexico, actually, and uh, the piano player on the song, he was supposed to follow me and follow my lead. And uh, there was someone, we didn't realize it, but at the church there, they had a, a drum set in the back, and this guy, as we were singing, tried to get out the drums and play the drums with us, and we didn't know it. And uh, afterward, the piano player comes up to me, and he goes, good job, Rich. I go, what did I do? The piano player is Brother Sloan. Some of you have met Brother Sloan. And he goes, you kept changing speeds on that song so the drummer couldn't figure it out. I go, I didn't do that on purpose, <laughs> amen. And uh, Brother Josh, I, I know I was... I started a little bit higher than we practiced this morning, so he did an awesome job. Appreciate him singing with me this morning. Let's go ahead and take a minute here to honor our fathers. So if you're a father here, if you would stand up so we could recognize you. If you're a father, all right. And Brother Pedro and Brother Ross, if you guys would come help me real quick. Uh, fathers, fathers, yes. Oh, yeah, we'll take one to them. We'll take one to them. All right, if you, uh, one of you will hold this box and the other one will just you guys will go around make sure each of the fathers gets one of these all right my wife made these special for you brother wagner you may not be getting peach cobbler today but you get some homemade chocolate chip cookies they're big ones too and uh also we have a book that we want to give to each of you we ordered them and unfortunately the publisher didn't get them out for us 
Uh, they're actually still sitting at the publisher's warehouse right now. And so we've been on the, we were on the phone all week with them. And so what we're going to do is after they get done passing those out to you, I'm going to have them come around and give you one of these little slips. And on it, it says, uh, this card entitles the bearer. And then I want you to put your name on it to one copy of the book, I'm Not Okay, by Dr. Paul Chappell. And so it's a good book. Thank you, brother. If you'd hand those out now for me. Uh, I want you to put your name on it so when we get those books in this week, uh, you can go to the bookstore next Sunday morning and you can redeem that coupon for your book, your copy of the book. It's about a 70-page book written by uh, Pastor Chapel from Lancaster Baptist Church in Lancaster, California. And uh, the title is I'm Not Okay. And uh, really on the front, it looks like it says I'm okay, but it has not in the middle. And he talks about how that a lot of times we think we're okay. But really our problems are uh, most of the problems we have in life are start right here with us. And so it's all about challenging us as men to be a, a better husband, a better father, and a better role model. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's go ahead and give these fathers a round of applause this morning. And appreciate you, gentlemen. You can go ahead and be seated. And uh, appreciate you being here. Appreciate what you mean yeah, to I'm our really church. Good. What's that? You're going to get more because they're really good? Yeah, oh, okay. Just <laughs> double checking, double checking. And uh, so I, I'll have to guard those, I guess, because someone might get tempted to come up and steal some later on. I didn't get a trium. Mrs. Davis, you tried one, right? And you said you and my wife couldn't even eat one together, a whole one, because they were big, right? And so praise the Lord. Glad they turned out good. That's one of the things I praise God for every day, as you can tell by my waistline, that I married a good cook. Amen. She knows how to cook and to bake, and praise God for it. That way you don't get a skinny anorexic preacher up here. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and turn to 3 John, if you would, to our text. 3 John, and we'll read our verse for the year, just verse number 4, and then I'll pray. 3 John, you can go ahead and remain seated. You've already been standing a bunch this morning. 3 John and verse number 4. The Bible says here, what's that? Oh, the change offering. Thank you, sister. Oh, you must want to win today, huh? The ladies want to win. All right, I am so sorry. We'll go ahead and read our verse and pray. Brother Ross, could you go across and find out which two young people are going to help us with the change offering this morning? Third John and verse number 4, I'll pray, and then we'll have those young people come and help us with the offering this morning. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And, of course, as I said, this has been our theme all year. And honestly, those of you that have been here for the majority of the services, Sunday morning services this year, uh, I my prayer is that I wouldn't sound like a broken record to you as we continue to look at this thought and this principle, but that ultimately, at the end of this year, you will have a hard time forgetting this principle because it is so important in 21st, uh, 21st century Christianity. It's so important that we learn to walk in truth. And so we'll look at that as we talk about fathers this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Lord God, I pray that you'd be with us this morning as we take your word, as we open it, and we study it. And Lord, I pray that you would challenge us, not just to fathers here this morning, but that you challenge each and every one of us as Christians to be stronger in our faith, to be stronger in our walk, to be stronger in our love for you. And Father, we'll give you the honor and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to have these two young people come and help us out this morning. Come on down here. I'm going to have you guys come. And Mark, you're going to start over here. And you're going to go here. Now, if you want to give to the boy side, you're going to put change in here. It will come right over here, Mark. If you want to give to the girl side, you're going to put change in this one. They're going to start out on opposite sides. They're going to go down. You guys are going to go down the outside of the aisles. Okay, so you're going to go over there, and you're going to go over there. We're in just a minute. After you get to the back, you guys switch. Okay, so Mark, you'll come back up this side, and you'll come back up this side. Okay, and if you have money for one specific side, make sure you get in on the right one. Now, once again, ladies, I want to put the pressure on, but the guys really got into it last week, 32 to 14. So. If you want to help the ladies win, you got to make sure it gets into this, this uh, offering plate this morning, all right? All right, let's go ahead and pray one more time. Ask the Lord to bless the offering and bless our vacation Bible school, and then they'll come around and receive it. Father, thank you once again for your goodness. Thank you for the good time we're able to have in your house. 
and the good spirit that's already here this morning. Father, we pray that you be with the preparations for our Bible school. We pray already that you start working on the hearts of the young people that are going to hear the challenges and be here for the singing and the skits. Lord, we just pray that you do something in their lives, Father, that it will transform them and mold them into your image. And Father, that we might see another generation raised up that would honor and glorify you. Father, just bless now the offering we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you go ahead and go out to that outside. You go to that outside. Go come around and see the offering at this time. You have some music for me, brother? And then he'll let us know at the end of the service which side won. Third John, look back there with me if you would once again. And I do appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be here for this Father's Day service. And I will try to uh, leave you with one thought this morning. Third John, verse number four, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And remember that we've been saying all year long that walking in truth means knowing what truth is and actually doing it. And as we've said over and over again, it does us no good, it does nobody any good, uh, or it, it doesn't help anyone out if we know what truth is, but we don't live according to truth. Now turn with me, if you would, back to 2 Kings. This is where we were at last week, and we're not going to finish the message from last week right now, but we will look at it here next Sunday. 2 Kings chapter number 20, and the Bible says here, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Last Sunday morning we talked about King Hezekiah, the king of Judah at this period of time, and how that Hezekiah was on his deathbed here. The prophet Isaiah told him, get your house in order, get things ready, because you're, you are going to die. You're not going to uh, recover from this illness. And uh, Hezekiah reacted the way anyone would react. He turned his face to the wall, and he began to seek God. And we said last Sunday morning that the difference between Hezekiah and most people is that this wasn't the first time Hezekiah had sought God. And we're not going to take time this morning to look at the things we covered last Sunday morning. But remember, Hezekiah, as soon as he became the king, he began to turn the nation of Judah back to God. He directed them towards the Lord and tried to encourage the people to love God with all their heart, their soul, and their might. And the Lord, as a result, heard his prayer here. And remember what his prayer was in verse number 3. He says, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. He doesn't say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I've messed up. I've wasted my life. Now help me out. He says, Lord, I want you just to remember how I've lived my life. And that will ultimately speak for itself. And next week when we finish studying this story, story we're going to see how that God did remember how Hezekiah lived his life. He did remember how that uh, Hezekiah walked in truth, and therefore he spared Hezekiah and spared his life, gave him uh, an extra 15 years to live. But now I want us to look back another book, to the book of 1 Kings. Hezekiah had an ancestor 
who we are all probably familiar with, uh, an ancestor by the name of Solomon. Solomon was one of his forefathers. And in 1 Kings chapter number 3, we have a story that is recorded about Solomon's life shortly after he has become the king. In 1 Kings chapter number 3, the Bible says in verse number 1, And Solomon made affinity. That word affinity uh, means that he uh, made a, a relationship with. He made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built under the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. Shortly after becoming the king, we have this story recorded. Now Solomon, as I said, one of Hezekiah's forefathers, Solomon was not just the king of Judah. He was the king of Israel and Judah. Remember that during Hezekiah's reign, there were two nations or two kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah. During Solomon's reign and Solomon's father, David, and the first king, Saul, it was all one kingdom. It was all one nation known as the kingdom or nation of Israel. And so Solomon, he had just come to the throne and had just been anointed the king of over Israel. His uh, ascent to the throne is very interesting. Back in chapter number one of, of this book, we find out that Solomon actually had an older brother who was next in line to become the king. His brother's name was Adonijah. Uh, you may also remember that Solomon had a, uh, 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 two brothers that were older by the name of Absalom who died and Amnon who died. So Adonijah was the next one in line to become the king. David was on his deathbed. He had grown older, and he was getting close to dying. And Adonijah, weirdly enough, decides to have a feast to celebrate the fact that he's going to be the next king of Israel, even though he hasn't been anointed the next king yet. Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet and other men that were close to David tell David about this, and David says, you know what, this isn't right. Solomon is, the next, is supposed to be the next king. This is the one that God had laid on David's heart to uh, set up to be the next king over Israel. Remember, God always looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the outward appearance. And he knew that Solomon inwardly was a humble man that was going to seek God's face. And so David went ahead and ha made sure that Solomon was anointed king over Israel, and Adonijah had to take uh, a back seat to Solomon. And then shortly after Solomon became king, David passes away. He dies off. Now he is the king, and he's been ruling for a short time. And as we're told here in verses 1 through 4, he went to worship God. There wasn't a temple yet. Remember when the, Moses was the leader of Israel and they traveled in the, the, uh, throughout the wilderness uh, on their way to the promised land? They had a tabernacle where they'd worship God. Well, they no longer had that and they no longer had the temple. And so they would go up to the high place and worship God. And here he was in Gibeon. And the Bible goes on to tell us in verse number 5 that the Lord appears to him in a dream. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said... Ask what I shall give thee. Solomon, what is it that you want? What a question to ask. We've looked at this passage before, and I've told you that if God were to ask us this morning what we would want, every one of us would probably have a different answer. Some of us might ask for health. Some of us might ask for wealth. Others might ask, like Solomon did, for wisdom. Look at his answer in verse number 6. His answer actually goes from verse 6 down to verse number 9. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. 
Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? He says, Lord, <clears throat> I need your help, because ultimately I know that I am nothing. And I know that this responsibility that I have is a great responsibility, and I can't do it. The Bible goes on to say in verse number 10, And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And as we've seen before when we've studied this passage, the Lord ends up telling Solomon, because you didn't ask for riches, because you didn't ask for victory over your enemies, because you didn't ask for health, he says, I'm going to give you all these things. I'm going to give you what you asked for. I'm going to give you wisdom, but I'm going to give you other things on top of that. I'll give you wealth, and I'll give you uh, a reign and peace, uh, a peaceful reign and, and, and victory over your enemies. I'll give you all of these things because you asked for something that was not selfish, but you asked for something that could help others. Now, with all that in mind, what I really want to draw your attention to for the next few minutes is back to verse number 6. God has just said to Solomon, Solomon, what do you want? Tell me what it is that you want, and I'll give it to you. And look at how he starts his answer. In verse 6, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth, and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. He starts out his answer by talking about his father. Now, if God came to you this morning, and of course we know God's not a genie, and I hope that we don't treat God like he's a genie, there's a lot of people in the world, there's a lot of people in Christianity that do treat God that way. They don't ever darken the door of a church. They don't ever open the Bible. They don't ever pray. But when they go through a trying time, they seek God. So they treat Him like He's in a little lamp that they can rub. I, I pray that we don't do that with God. Because He's much more than a God that can meet our needs. He's a heavenly Father to us yeah. and for us. And here He asks this question, what do you want? What do you want me to give you? And the first thing he says is, well, you know, my, my father, David, I think about when he reigned and how you were good to him. And I believe that as Solomon is having this first one-on-one -on -one encounter with God, this first conversation with God, that he thinks about his David. His, his father, David, was a great man. Great man. Remember the story of him, David going out and fighting Goliath as just a young uh, shepherd boy how he was a faithful shepherd, he was a, a mighty warrior, he was loyal to Saul even when Saul wanted to kill him, and then later when he was elevated to king, he was a great king. He took the nation of Israel uh, from one point and, and brought it to the next point as far as success and honor as far as in God's eyes. And so he's getting ready to ask God for some help, but he sets it up by talking about his dad because that's what he has to draw on. My dad, my father. I look at my father and he's my hero, Lord. And I saw how that you blessed him and that you were merciful to him and you showed him kindness. You were so good to him. I looked up to him and, and honestly, here's what I am. In verse number 7, look at the, the end of that verse, what he says about himself. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Solomon grew up in the king's house, but he didn't grow up with a silver spoon in his mouth, so to speak, as far as he didn't grow up with this mentality that I deserve everything I get. He obviously understood, I am nobody. I am but a child. I cannot do this job on my own. I need your help, God, to do this. And I know that my father was successful and he was blessed because he had your help. And just like you helped him, I pray that you would help me. This morning as we talk about fathers and we honor fathers, I think that it's every father's desire that his children would look up to him. Whether he has all girls, like Brother Wagner, or whether he has all boys, or whether he has boys and girls, you want your children to look up to you. You want them to love you. You want them to honor you and respect you. You want them to, even though you know that you have maybe some, some uh, faults or failures, you want them to be a little bit like you. 
And you want them to say, one day, I, I want to be like Dad. Right now, Timothy's going through that stage where we give him a choice. And I was telling this to my dad last night. My dad chuckled about it because I think he understands because I went through that, that time in my life when I was young as well, where if he has a choice, he can do something with Dad or he can do something with Mom, he's doing it with Dad. He wants to be with Dad. When we go out door knocking, he wants to be with Dad. If we're playing a game, we're on Dad's. I'm on Dad's team. Well, uh, you even, I even started noticing that he picks up mannerisms that I have because hanging around me. Last night he was watching a movie with Brother Davis, and uh, he was getting excited about the movie, and he goes, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, Brother Davis just started laughing, and that's what I say sometimes too, but obviously he has no idea what the context of that saying is. And so it, as a dad, it just it makes you proud. It also makes you humble to know that your kids look up to you and love you and want to be like you. There's a great responsibility there for fathers. But as I said this morning, it's not just to fathers. Every one of us in here, whether you're a father or a mother or a sister or a brother, you have someone who looks up to you. Whether you're a neighbor of someone, uh, you have someone who looks to you and they watch you. And they, they long to be a little bit like you. Yesterday, as we were out knocking on doors, uh, this was a very humbling thing to me. There was a lady, my wife knocked on the door, and the lady answered the door. And the lady says, I know you. My wife goes, you do? She goes, yeah, I saw you and your family walking down the street the other day. And we walked as a family to Circle K to get something to drink on Friday. And she goes, I see you guys walking every once in a while as a family. And she says, you guys knock on my door every year. She goes, and I always think to myself, man, that's, what a neat little family they have. That was a humbling thing to me because you, sometimes you don't know who's watching. You don't know, realize that people are watching your testimony. Yeah. There's someone watching you today. There's someone who wants to be you today, whether you're a father or not. And someone who, if God were to come to them right now and to say, hey, what do you want? They'd say, I want to be like that person. Now, with all that said, I want to point out a couple of things real quickly that I think are interesting from verse number 6 about David. First off, you notice how Solomon refers to his father David. Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father. He refers to him as God's servant. That ought to be all of our desire. That people would know that we serve God. There is no greater call. And I'm not talking about being a pastor or a missionary. I'm talking about being a Christian this morning. If you are a Christian, you are a child of the King. If you are a Christian, you're more than a child of the King. You're a servant to the King. You're a servant of God. And He says, hey, you know my Father. My Father is one of your servants. My Father is your servant. Now think about David once again. He could have said, you know my father, David, the shepherd boy that killed the giant. My father, David, the great warrior. My father, David, the great king. That's not how he referred to his dad at all. He referred to his dad as my father, David, thy servant. So often we want to be elevated in people's eyes. We want to be the next Bill Gates with all the money in the world. But really, remember, whenever you're elevated, there's always going to be people that are going to be aiming to shoot you down. We need to stop worrying about elevating ourselves and just worry about surrendering ourselves to God and submitting ourselves to God. The Bible tells us that if we submit ourselves to Him in due time, He'll be the one who elevates us. He says, My Father, David, thy servant. This morning when people think about you, do they think of you as a servant of God? Do they know that you're a child of God? Do they know that... You serve Him, first and foremost. By the way, as a servant of God, that tells even more than just that that man, David, served God. It meant that he served others. Because what was the first command that was given? That we're supposed to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. But then remember, Jesus said, and we studied this a couple Sundays ago, that Jesus said that, I give to you a new commandment. And that new commandment is that you love one another. That you... So, uh, serve one another. That you help one another. Hey, someone who is a servant of God doesn't just serve God, but serves others as well. When people look at you and they think about you, do they think of you as God's servant this morning? Someone who helps others out? Or do they think of you that, as one that wants to be served? The next thing we see in verse number 6, he goes on to say, 
He says, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart and with thee. He says, You showed him great mercy. Why did God show him great mercy? Well, he goes on to tell us why he showed him great mercy. He says, According as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. He says, as my father did that which was right, as he walked in truth, he did the things that he knew was right, you were merciful to him. I saw your hand of mercy upon him. In other words, he made mistakes in his life, but you continued to show your hand of mercy to him. By the way, someone that receives mercy is someone who shows mercy. David received mercy because... He showed mercy. I don't know how many of you remember the story of David when his son Absalom uh, had rebelled against him. But Absalom came and took over the kingdom. And David and his, uh, his mighty men, they uh, fled from the capital city. And as they fled, there was a man by the name of Shimei. Shimei saw David. And Shimei was from the house of Saul, and he began to curse at David, and he began to throw dust in the air, and he began to throw rocks at David. Uh, of course, not even coming close to hitting David. And one of his mighty men said, let me go over and kill this guy. And David says, no, leave him alone. He was merciful to him. Later on, as after Absalom had been killed, he's coming back. And Shimei has a totally different attitude because he knows who's getting ready to sit on the throne. David's going back to be the king once again. And David shows Shimei mercy. Instead of having him killed, once again, he shows him that merciful spirit. Not only that, Absalom, when Absalom and his soldiers were coming to find David and his men, David told his men, he said, if you get Absalom, don't kill him. His son wanted his head wanted his throne, wanted to cut him off from the earth. And he says, show him mercy. David was a very merciful man. He was mer And he received God's mercy because he walked in truth. Are you a merciful person today? Do you show mercy to other people? Or do you just want to receive mercy from other people? It's hard to show mercy. That's a very hard thing to do. Because when someone wrongs us, we automatically want to retaliate. And we want to treat them the same way that we, that we were treated by them. Remember when we were kids, our parents used to teach us two wrongs don't make a right? It's amazing how we forget some of those things as we get older. Or how we teach them to our kids, but we forget to apply them to our own lives. Hey, if we want to be someone that others look up to and say, I want to be like that person, then we need to make ourselves servants to God. But we also need to make sure that we're merciful to others. At the end of that verse... In verse number 6, he says, And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. He left behind a good heritage. He left behind, even though he had Absalom, who rebelled against him, and he had Amnon, who did wickedly, he did leave behind a goodly heritage. Remember, Hezekiah, the king that we had just looked at in 2 Kings, Hezekiah was a descendant of David's. Hezekiah was a descendant of Solomon's. God used David in a great and mighty way, this boy that nobody had ever heard of, given the charge of watching over sheep out in the field. God used him in a great and mighty way to the point where not only did he become king, but those that followed after him reigned. And when you look at what happened with the nation of Israel or the kingdom of Israel, as I mentioned before, later on after Solomon, it split into two different kingdoms. The kings that reigned over Israel were wicked kings. But those weren't the kings that came from David and from Solomon. The kings who reigned over Judah, such as Hezekiah, those were the kings that were descendants of David's and Solomon's. And the Bible tells us if you read through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you'll find that almost every one of those kings, the kings of Judah, did that which was right in the sight of God. They had a godly heritage, a good heritage. Because he walked in truth and he did right, God blessed him in a great and mighty way. 
This morning, God wants you to be an individual, a father, that your children can look up to, that others can look up to. But you have to purpose that you're going to surrender and serve God. That you're going to walk in His truth. And it's not always easy to walk in God's truth, especially in the day and age in which we live, when it's not popular to live according to the Bible, when it's not politically correct to live according to the Bible. God will bless you as a result if you do these things. In closing, let me remind you of something. Someone says, well, preacher, I just can't be perfect. Guess what? You don't have to be this morning. I'm so glad God doesn't expect me to be perfect. He expects me, as Paul wrote, to strive for the mastery, which means I need to strive every day to live my life the way that God would want me to live it. I need to strive every day to try to make decisions that would honor and please God, but when and uh, if and when I stumble, God is there to pick me up, not to kick me while I'm down, not to kick dust in my face, to help me back up. And if anybody understood this, Solomon understood this, Remember what he said, uh, the second point that we made? He said about his father David, he said that God had shown his father great mercy. Does anybody remember who Solomon's mother was? It was a woman by the name of Bathsheba. Solomon was Bathsheba's son. And remember, Bathsheba was married to a man by the name of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was killed by David. David had seen Bathsheba, had coveted her, wanted to marry her, and so he sent, made sure that Uriah was sent into battle, into the hottest part of the battle, so that way he would be killed. And as soon as he was killed, he took Bathsheba to be his wife. By the way, if you study it out, you'll find out that Uriah wasn't just any, other, any soldier in, in David's army. Uriah was one of David's mighty men. He was one of David's close buddies. One of the ones that was with David when David was being chased and hunted by Saul. And David turned his back on Uriah and said, Uriah, I'm sorry, but I've got an eye for your wife. And so he had Uriah killed and then later married Bathsheba. And he lost his first child with Bathsheba. God brought judgment upon David. But then God was merciful to David. And the second son that they had was Solomon. And Solomon went to reign and become the king over Israel. Solomon, the product of a marriage that never should have been, he understood God's mercy. David was a great man. The Bible says that David was a man after the heart of God, or after God's own heart. But David wasn't perfect. And God doesn't expect you to be perfect this morning. But He expects you to strive, to try, to do your best to walk in His truth. And as you do that, he promises to use you and to elevate you and to make you someone that others can look up to. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you would take the challenge this morning and help us to apply it to our hearts and our lives. Father, I pray that we would purpose that.